Okay, uh, good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Philip from IMU Clinicals Campus and I'm here to introduce as well as help uh, our guest lecturer in IMU, Dr. Peter Nori, to deliver his presentation. Uh, <laughs> so, Dr. Peter Nori is a close friend as well as actually my previous boss. So I worked in Canberra from 2000 and to 2010 and he was the chief psychiatrist in Canberra. In fact, he came and recruited me in Malaysia. We had our interview in KLIA, but uh, that was while he was on transit. And it was a pleasure working in Canberra with him. Uh, he's now semi-retired, but is very involved in evaluating psychiatric services around Australia, as well as the region, including Solomon Islands and Kiribati soon as well. So he's going to be discussing psychiatric services in Australia. And then I'll chip in and give a little bit about uh, the Malaysian uh, psychiatric services and uh, what they are like. And then it'll be up to you to make that comparison. Uh, and then we hope that it can be an interactive session where you can maybe pose, pose questions to either of us. There are no slides, uh, but it'd be just you know uh, talking to you and t telling you what we identify as the differences. So we'll start off with Peter, thanks. Thanks, Philip, and look, nice nice to come back to Malaysia at this stage. Um, my posting this time is for nearly two weeks, uh, mainly at the clinical school uh, at Seremban, and uh, uh, mostly working with the SEM7 students in medicine. Uh, and uh, we've actually covered a, a whole wide range of topics, and uh, I guess what they've been able to have is, is, is my feeling on how uh, mental health uh, is actually... Uh, run in Australia and we thought it was a good idea uh, maybe to sort of just look at comparison of mental health services uh, for today's talk. But up on the screen uh, behind me and what you can see um, uh, is the title of um, what we actually presented yesterday uh, to the students and to an assembled group. So, um, you know, youth in a changing, youth mental health in a changing world has been the theme of World Mental Health Day, which was, um, which was about two weeks ago. Uh, and the World Federation of Mental Health has had a number of areas in which they've encouraged us to think about. And I just, I guess, just summarise those very briefly, uh, remembering that um, I issues such as bullying, cyberbullying, uh, major mental illness, uh, trauma, sexu uh, sexual identity, uh, and self harm and suicide are very major areas in mental health, and they have unique ways of presenting often uh, in uh, children and young people, adolescents and young adults. And the importance of recognising that and the importance of providing uh, an increased level of services is something that this World Mental Health Day actually encouraged. And so with that introduction, I guess I just want to sort of start and do a little bit of comparison about, you know, what we see our services run in Australia. And I want to start with primary health. So our general practitioners are largely um, self-employed business people. However, the government actually subsidises most of that, uh, most of the cost for running the practice. So in, in part first, we have a system that is called Medicare, uh, set up uh, roughly 30 plus years ago and designed to offer almost a comprehensive free health service. And I guess the only thing to say is, you know, that there's always a bit of an exception. And one of the things that's happened, I think, probably to all health services uh, through the world is that the costs of delivering health in some ways have overtaken uh, what governments feel uh, can be provided. So our GPs are left with two choices. They can actually uh, bill the patient for what is called the government fee, or they can actually add an extra fee for service. Uh, now that can be a very complicated system for a patient to run through, um, and particularly I guess if um, someone is uh, not well off and uh, can't afford to go and get care, and they've expected to get free care. The, the term for this is very interesting. It's called a bulk bill. So basically what happens is um, the patient actually signs off a form. Uh, the GPs practice, pull all the forms together at the end of each day. It's sent off now electronically to the Medicare offices and the GP gets paid. 
if the patient has to, uh, so the advertisement often that you will see uh, in shop windows is something like we are a bulk billing practice and so the patients going in know that that service then is provided for free. Now GPs are responsible for providing um, you know a lot of uh, I guess general health care as you would expect. They are how often, uh, how they are however in Australia a, a very significant force behind providing um, I guess you know um, low to medium level mental health care. So our general practitioners know and treat most of the depression in the community, so certainly at the um, area where there is a, um, a degree of understanding and the person can actually respond to medication. And so they know the use of medications, they can prescribe those, uh, and they actually have regular follow-up for patients in terms of managing the illness. Anxiety equally is something that is dealt with uh, very well uh, in the general practice setting. And the support that that actually provides for um, a, probably about two thirds of that patient group is very significant. Beyond the GP, uh, he or she has got the option obviously of referring on to a mental health professional. So either referring on to a psychiatrist or referring on to an allied health practitioner or indeed a nurse practitioner. And I'm going to cover that a little bit later in terms of some of the new services that the government has initiated uh, in terms of options for non-medically trained uh, colleagues. So largely, as I say, you know, the GPs are the filter, I guess, and, and I'm pretty sure when Philip comments, um, you know, I've understood that is pretty much the same sort of pattern as you would see in Malaysia, like the GP filters, um, filters out. Um, now, we've, if we move on to um, basically hospital and community mental health care, uh, I want you to just think a little bit of the map of Australia, very large country where most of uh, the people actually live actually around the seacoast because the inside is very, very warm, very hot, very dry and not very sustainable for life. And around that seacoast, um, you know, if we divide the country up, there are six states and two territories. My working life was actually spent, uh, the last 12 years of my working life was spent in Canberra, uh, the Australian Capital Territory, which is this tiny little bit of land landlocked into New South Wales where Sydney is. It's about three hours drive south of Sydney. And unusually, Canberra is actually a cold place. So people look at Australia very often and think it's warm. Uh, we actually get very cold in winter. We can go down to minus seven, minus eight in the morning. And so it's certainly, you know, different than the, the pictures of sun and sea and surf that you see in some areas in Australia. Now the contrast is we only have about a 10 minute traffic jam every morning when we drive to work. So there are some good things about living there as well. Uh, but as I say, there is the ACT, the other territory is called the Northern Territory, which is the little, uh, is the middle part of the country uh, going up towards the north of which Darwin is, is the capital and every other area of Australia actually has uh, basically a state. For the purposes of this talk and the delivery of health care, the states and territories are largely the same. But the central government uh, actually divests all of that secondary level health care to the states and territories. And so the budget is actually in the state and territory budget. I'm a New Zealander originally and I'm used to sort of one country, one system. And so when I first came to Australia and found that there were actually eight, area, eight different states and territories that pr provided health care, that took me a bit of getting used to. Having said that, they are largely the same as well. And so the fundamental thing to um, uh, bear in mind is, is that uh, a trip to hospital or a trip to a mental, uh, community mental health service is free of charge in every respect. And so the patient is actually able to uh, go and see the doctor, go and see the nurse or allied health professional, receive all levels of care in, that, in the system and actually uh, not pay anything for that. And so services around that admission are also provided as well. So we have, we've got the ability to actually look after that person and arrange continuative care through our service. If I go off to one side for a minute, the option is that if people do have what we call private health insurance, so if you actually choose to actually pay 
uh, a certain amount per month or per year to insurance company, you can actually have that care provided in a private hospital or provided by a psychiatrist working out of their own private office. Uh, and that's usually, again, uh, largely covered by the insurance company, so there's not, there's occasionally a little bit of extra to pay, but not much else. So within that, we also have, um, I guess, major mental health initiatives in terms of costing um, and the support for the non-government uh, organisations in, in the way they're provided. And again, they're provided actually more by the central government. Um, and often a mental health project, so if I look at um, uh, an example where they wanted to actually provide uh, support for patients attending appointments and so forth, they set up a new initiative um, and that is actually the states and territories receive subsidised funding to set that up. However, the requirement is after about four years um, of that project, the states and territories need to find the funding themselves to take that over. Behind the scenes, and as chief psychiatrist, what I used to say to my colleagues is my job was largely, to, I guess, to protect the clinical colleagues from the policy procedure and the negotiation and all of that behind the scenes. Because you can imagine when there are separate sources of funding, there are often debates about how best we will actually provide service. And I guess I want to give you an illustration of something that wasn't quite so good but potentially became very good. Uh, following the theme of uh, uh, World Mental Health Day, uh, we have a colleague, Professor Pat McGorry, who has been a very strong proponent for youth mental health. Uh, he's uh, spent his life's career looking at early intervention, particularly in psychosis. And what he was aware of is really that we actually didn't provide very strong level of service to young people in terms of the special needs they have for developing psychosis. And so the pressure he put on government, um, along with a number of colleagues, was very significant, such as, firstly, they recognised his works and made him Australian of the Year for 2010. So he added that extra, I guess you could say, political influence. Before that, however, he had grown frustrated with the, uh, I guess, the, the lack of speed of government services to provide that level of health care. So he set up an organisation called Headspace, and you might later on want to just Google Headspace Australia. And Headspace is a unique organisation where you have the opportunity, it's basically, in, in simple terms, it's a drop-in centre. Uh, young people have got the chance to go in, discuss, uh, you know, how they're going at school, how they're going with their studies at university. They've got their opportunity just to just ask about various um, parts of their mental health, but it's not necessarily like going into a formal doctor's appointment. And so people are actually happy to drop in, and once they get comfortable in that environment, they actually go ahead to actually discuss their mental health and their stress and so forth very well. And so out of that Headspace uh, area was an initiative that we would actually want to make sure that Headspace was not just in the major cities in Australia, that it was actually in a number of rural areas and a number of smaller cities. And at that stage, Headspace had uh, one um, office basically in Canberra for 400,000 people and the initiative was that we would actually try and have a more extensive program uh, looking at support for young people with psychosis. And that was the, uh, I guess, the mantra that was presented to me and to my executive uh, in Canberra. And we had a look at our population and we actually went back and said, well, actually, there's not a lot of point in Canberra providing us with, a, you know, probably at that stage about five and a half million Australian dollars to provide services for young people with psychosis because we probably have about maybe 15 to 20 of those presenting per year. What we actually want to do is we actually want to have a full service that incorporates young people presenting with any type of illness so that those with bipolar, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, depression, we could actually have a service that would look after the whole community. <coughs> well, government processes being what they are, the central government said, actually, no. Uh, unless you actually do it exactly according to the model of early psychosis, you can't have the money. And so we actually had a discussion with our ACT government 
And we bravely went back and said, well, thank you very much. We know you were going to give us five and a half million dollars, but actually that money would not be wisely spent. Uh, and so we're actually going to use some of the ACT health money to set up our young person's service to provide for the whole community. Um, now that was a, a, a pretty brave and a bit of a dangerous move because we actually had to find funding to actually do that. But the success was, I guess, what we're able to do in that situation is look at the needs of the community and plan and prepare and then have a service that actually best fits our community. And I think that's very much the model that Australian, Australian services have taken on uh, because what they want to do is make sure that I guess we're what we call needs responsive. So as I say, an example that you know maybe didn't sound very good from the outset but actually has had a very good outcome. Um, within that, um, going back to the sort of level of care that's provided, um, we've got the opportunity to, through the hospital admissions to actually provide all of the services and so there is, you know, really the patient can leave hospital with, with no bill at all. Um, once they return to the community, we have community mental health services and I'm actually going to shortly outline the structure of the way the ACT services work. Um, but the other thing, first of all, I guess to comment on is pharmaceutical supplies. And so I think we all know now, you know, there is a range of medication for many health conditions. Uh, mental health doesn't have the most expensive medications. And in fact, you know, some that are for treatment of HIV or for uh, immunological treatments will be thousands of dollars per um, administration. Now the government along with Medicare set up a medication uh, or a pharmaceutical benefit scheme that allows people who are working to pay $39.50 per script. So it doesn't matter what the medicine is, it costs $39.50. Now if, the, if it's a medicine that's been around for a long time and the cost is maybe only $15, you pay $15. But if the cost is over $39.50, that's all you pay. So in rough terms, that's a, you know, between 13 and 14 ringgits per item of medication. That's even if some immunological therapy uh, costs $3,000 or more. Um, now there's also the, op the option that if you are a pensioner, uh, so if you're on a government sponsored wage or benefit and you can't afford much, then that prescription will only cost you roughly $6 or about two ringgits per script. Um, and so when people go into our community mental health centres and we actually need to write the scripts for them out of hospital, we know that they're only going to be paying a small amount of money to get that script. So the types, you know, I've, I've said there are six, six states and two territories. The types of service that are provided you would think should be largely the same. But I want you to bear in mind there are, there are very, very different areas in Australia. So Tasmania, as the smallest state, has just under half a million people. And it's over, you know, it's not a big land mass, but it's quite separate. There are three main population areas that are quite separate. The ACT is this very small area with about 400,000 people. And I guess Tasmania and, and uh, the ACT are about the closest in comparison. And then the Northern Territory is this big, big land mass. Um, they don't have, you know, anything more than probably about um, um, 180,000 people in that huge landmass. So about 50,000 people concentrated in Darwin, about 40,000 people concentrated in, in Alice Springs, right in the middle, near Uluru or Ayers Rock. Um, and so the, the needs for the Northern Territory are vastly different than the needs of Canberra. If I wanted to go and see any of my colleagues, any of the clinics that were working in mental health, the furthest I had to drive was half an hour. If someone's in Darwin uh, as the chief psychiatrist and a colleague of ours became chief psychiatrist up there, if she wanted to go and see the mental health services in Alice Springs, that's a three and a half hour flight. So, you know, a very significant distance to travel and the needs were very different. And so, and then if you look at some of the bigger states and territories, uh, for example, Sydney now having seven million people and other very big towns in New South Wales, <coughs> the structures are very different. So I just want to do this slight comparison for Tasmania and Australian Capital Territory. 
the chief psychiatrist, uh, so myself, and I, I should declare that for three years earlier in my career, I worked in Tasmania, so I know that service very well. Um, the chief psychiatrist and the mental health um, executive actually had also responsibility for clinical care. And so we'd actually make sure that, you know, we, we were part of our colleagues and would visit. <coughs> in the bigger states and territories, the chief psychiatrist is actually more a figurehead. So he or she actually writes the policies and uh, suggests how services could be run. But there may be 10 or 12 or 20 separate health services that actually work independently that nominally um, the chief psychiatrist would have some responsibility for, but in terms of direct reporting, there isn't anything. So you can have a situation, and we did have it for a little while in uh, Victoria, the state where Melbourne is based, uh, where the chief psychiatrist would write off lots of policies and send them off to his colleagues, and the colleagues would actually write back and say, well, actually, we don't like that very much, so we probably won't follow your directive. And so, you know, the, the advantage I had was that, you know, I not only had responsibility for the service, I also had, um, you know, direct relationship with my colleagues to ensure that healthcare would be run. So, to give you a structure of what services we provide in the ACT, so we actually have a service that is run by an executive, so there's a, an executive director who is, uh, doesn't have to be clinically trained. Our current executive director actually is a physiotherapist. Um, and in, in every other respect, people like uh, myself, the director of nursing, director of allied health, actually report to that executive, executive director. Uh, but the clinical executive have responsibility for the, uh, basically the running of the service. And we divided our service into six main areas. So the first was acute mental health care. And so acute mental health care looks at the, uh, the wards and the, um, the basically inpatient care. And so we actually had a 40 bedded unit, uh, which was uh, a, a, a actually a very good build and it's, it's um, it's somewhere, something that we were incredibly proud to show people about. We actually were very strong in having a focus of recovery and mental health there. Uh, and we had separate bedrooms for each patient with a separate ensuite. And so patients actually had their own area, their own privacy. Um, within that 40, 40 beds, we had the opportunity to also put alongside it a 10 bed what we call high dependency units, so that was uh, locked. We could actually provide care for those who were most anxious, most agitated and distressed. But the interesting thing is between those two areas, we actually built a two bed, what we called step through, flow through unit. And so that unit actually allowed us the opportunity for care for someone who was maybe very significantly ill. It allowed us to care for mothers and babies. Uh, for an acute elderly patient who was waiting for a bed in the elderly services, uh, for maybe a patient who would, had come in from the jail and we ha would have to have guards with them, so it was much better to be in, a, in a, an isolated area. And also maybe someone who was physically unwell as well as having a mental illness. And so that, that, you know, that was a very uh, good functioning ward. And in actual fact, Philip, I think it opened maybe only a few months after you left. Um, we also have another ward in the north of the Territory, which is a 20-bed ward, which actually provides service to our northern community as well. Beyond acute care, you've got to follow through with community mental health care. And um, I won't draw it, but roughly Canberra is a set of little communities. Uh, they actually call it the bush capital. And so between the north community and the middle north community is actually an area of about five to six kilometres, which essentially is bush, like no one lives there. And then we have the city, and we have a mid-south and an outer south. Uh, so we actually roughly have five communities in Canberra, and we've developed community mental health services so that each of those communities has a community mental health centre. Um, and those community mental health centres actually cover virtually all psychiatric illness. The reason that that's particularly uh, a factor in Canberra is that we actually for a long time had a shortage of general practitioners and we actually still have a shortage of private psychiatrists and so the public mental health system you know was actually the, the responsible for almost all the mental health care that happened in the ACT. Now those community mental health centres then see 
uh, depression, anxiety, uh, all the other major illnesses, uh, they actually ar arrange lower level of counselling quite often. Uh, and I guess it's different from some of the bigger cities where quite often public mental health services have actually delegated the uh, uh, treatment and management of depression and anxiety to general practitioners. So, uh, you know, again, we've been responsive uh, to the needs by having those community mental health centres work. They are staffed by a team leader, uh, a group of psychiatrists and nurses, occupational therapists, psychologists and uh, so the nurses, psychologists, OT, social workers um, actually do a role that we call case management and case management is essentially responsible for the day-to-day, week-by-week care of those people firstly who might be on involuntary treatment uh, and so the, a provision for an order from uh, the court that actually says you must have treatment. Uh, and those people we have a responsibility to have contact with at least every two weeks. Uh, but the case managers actually provide that care and they link back into the psychiatrist uh, as needed either for a review or if there is a crisis um, or for the regular uh, follow-up that's required. But every morning there is a team meeting where there, there is a uh, review of the people who are going to need to be uh, actively sought out and supported and treated that day. And also those people who've come in through from acute care overnight uh, or from uh, a person called the duty officer who took calls the day before and says, you know, this is, this is the work plan for the day. The next, the next group, so this is number three now, is child and adolescent mental health services. And because those services are more specialised and need to be more refined, uh, we've basically divided Canberra in half. Uh, in the middle of Canberra, uh, or the, the, um, um, uh, the living areas within Canberra, there is a big lake, and it's actually an artificial lake that was put in in 1961. Uh, and roughly that divides Canberra into north and south. And so we have a northern child and adolescent team and a southern child and adolescent team. And that team's responsible for um, managing people up to the age of 18. In the new plans for mental health, and particularly again following back to the theme of World Mental Health Day, uh, there will come a time when we hope that we actually provide services for young people up to the age of 24. Because we recognise that the, a the ages of 18 to 24 is actually a pretty special area where someone is sort of neither a child nor maybe are they a complete functioning adult in terms of others, you know, finishing study and so forth. And so our child and adolescent teams will eventually cover treatment to the age of 24. Uh, and what they do is they actually review each case that comes into them as um, a presentation first of all and allocate particular workers to those cases to actually make sure that the assessment and treatment is done. Forensic mental health services is number four. A little idiosyncrasy here, uh, for a long time the Australian T Capital Territory had no prison. And so if anyone was convicted in a, of an offence for which imprisonment happened, they actually went to New South Wales. Uh, so across the border into another jail. In 2009 we got our jail and the only thing that didn't plan very well is we didn't alongside that get our forensic inpatient community, uh, for forensic inpatient mental health service. So we had a very, very functional forensic community team that would do a whole lot of work with people but if there were um, prisoners who needed mental health care they at that stage had to come into the adult unit. 2016, just before um, I finished my full-time work in Canberra, we were really proud to open our forensic mental health service, inpatient service, which caters for prisoners who are mentally disordered, those who may need assessment because of offending, and basically has an acute area of 10 beds and a uh, rehabilitation area of 15 beds. Uh, and that, that specialist service has actually been met one of our very strong needs. The fifth area of service uh, is our, um, uh, sorry, along with our forensic mental health service, we also have responsibility for primary mental health care in the prison. 
So the fifth service is basically our rehabilitation service and our specialty services. And so we actually provide services for older people for which we have a 15 bed ward. And the other, uh, the interesting thing about our older persons team is they almost never have outpatients. And the reason for that is what they do is they actually assess the referrals and the doctor and the case manager actually go out and they visit the person in their home. Now, that's important for elderly people because very often in the development of some older person's mental illnesses, you know, the, the cognitive capacities are greatly reduced. And if that person's going to stay at home, we actually need to know that they're actually functional in the home environment. So something as simple as being able to boil the kettle, make a cup of tea or coffee, um, do the washing, plan a meal. And so the occupational therapists actually assess that in the home environment and make recommendations. If someone needs hospital, they go into hospital, but then we know the home environment to plan for their ongoing care. And that's very much, I think, a, a good example of flow through uh, mental health care right from you know, the person's home and community into hospital and back home again. The last part of the service is our alcohol and drug services. And they actually cater for you know, many areas and, and that was where uh, Philip actually spent uh, a good half of his time but also worked in one of the community mental health clinics. And so we actually have a, a six bed uh, detox unit we have addiction management services, we have services that go into the general hospital. And so providing support for those who actually have a substance abuse problem. So look, I hope that gives you some idea of just, you know, where the services are operating from. The little thing that's happened in the last couple of years is we've actually now, uh, through our consumer, or so, so we call often patients our consumers, our consumer and carer groups, they were fundamental in saying what we want to do is make sure that we have a more comprehensive degree of support. And we have now started employing people who are past sufferers of mental illness or maybe are still on their journey towards recovery. And so they have be become colleagues alongside the professional team and we call this our peer workforce. And I want you to think about the importance of that because if we as professionals go and see someone and organise their treatment, I think we can say, look, we, we empathise with you. We have some understanding of what that must be like. But we often can't actually go there and say, I've been there. I've been to that very dark place where you were three months ago when you were very unwell. Um, and so the peer person can say, I, I actually have done that and I know what it's like, and I'm here to support you at a time when things are not so good. Um, but you can imagine it's quite a challenge because, you know, we actually have to embrace this as, as a new way of care. Uh, and, you know, I have to say the service has been very excited about that development, and I think it will be something, you know, that will continue to go well. Lastly, I just want to come back to a couple of services that are just a little bit different. So firstly, um, we have something called a step up, step down service. Now step up is basically the area where someone is becoming unwell. It might be either for the first time or they might be having a relapse. They're not ill enough to need hospital, but they're not well enough to actually stay at home. And so we actually have a residential service which they can go and they can receive 24 hour care. It's not you know, the level of hospital care, but it's actually good care that allows that person time out and our workers come in and they actually provide the mental health care and support in that environment. Step down is the other side. So if you've been to hospital and you're maybe not quite well enough to be home, but you probably don't need the level of hospital care, you can actually go to the same, same uh, accommodation area and actually receive 24-hour uh, care and plan for your discharge back home. So those are step up, step down services. We have them for the child and adolescent service and for the adult service. Uh, and they've, they've uh, been in operation now for probably close to 10 years and have been very successful. If, however, we want to partner with um, our GPs in terms of ongoing care, um, you know, the, the public mental health burden for our workers is, you know, they're very, very busy and we need to make decisions sometimes about what's the best person to, to discharge to general practice care. And so we have shared care sometimes where the GP and the psychiatrist work together to provide care. 
Uh, we also have a situation where if someone's being assessed as needing uh, significant support but maybe not uh, full medical psychiatric support, the GPs now have a fund uh, which they can uh, get, get from the central government to provide up to 12 sessions of psychological therapy. So we actually contract some of our private psychologists who are then paid a contract fee by the government to provide up to 12 sessions. Uh, and that's been a very important part of, I guess, uh, preventive mental health care or early mental health care that reduces the need for uh, formal admission to our ward. There is the opportunity to extend those 12 sessions uh, in various circumstances. The GP is also able to do a full mental health care plan and so that, that is actually again a, a special Medicare proposal item that is actually funded by the central government and they can actually then bring in various services within that plan to help the person. And the last thing I'm going to comment on is, is something similar to our peer workforce, so our people with mental illness who are now part of our workforce. There's another government funded scheme called PHAMS, P-H-A-M-S, Personal Helpers and Mentors Service. So Personal Helpers and Mentors Service. That actually allows, again, uh, people who've got, who either volunteers who understand mental illness and actually want to actually help, or in fact, um, people with mental illness who've recovered to go out and be buddies for people who've got mental illness in the community. So we've not only got the peer workforce within our uh, regular services, we've got the volunteer force that are actually working uh, daily in the community. Um, now I, I think that means, if I summarise it, I think we're very lucky to have all those services. Uh, you can imagine it takes a lot of coordination to make it all run smoothly. And also like anything, you can imagine that it you know, in a perfect world it would run smoothly, it often doesn't. And so often the job of someone like me was to link all the things together, to manage a complaint that said, you know, I'm not getting the care I want, and to organise that that works. Um, and I know that I have seen in, in the time that I have been uh, coming and working with Philip in Malaysia, um, I've actually seen some enormous changes in your system here. Um, you know, some real light, some real hope that some of these um, services that I've talked about happening uh, in my community will in fact be a reality within the services here not too far away. But with that I'm going to pass over to Philip just to do the contrast with Malaysia. Thank you, Peter. So maybe I'll just touch on a few points and then we'll open up to Q&A. I think one is maybe looking at policy and governance and really in Malaysia only recently uh, we've had the Mental Health Act approved and the, then the, <coughs> what do you call it, the enforcement of that act, uh, which is still in parliament and not really out, but uh, slowly and hopefully we can now decide which centers are gazetted to have people with mental health problems which are residential homes, which are not, which are services that can be provided and licenses for those sort of things as well. Uh, funding in Malaysia, I think, is really poor. 1.5% uh, of the health budget goes to mental health, uh, which is ridiculous, uh, you know, because as we know from the National Health and Morbidity Survey, well, it suggests that one third of the population have a mental health problem. Uh, but if only 1.5% of a health budget goes to address that issue, then it's almost negligible. I probably should have said in contrast, the uh, uh, ACT system has 10.5% of its um, health budget for mental health. So there you go. Um, the other thing is mental health in the Ministry of Health is actually under a big cluster called NCD, or non-communicable diseases. So, you know, if you have one person looking after NCD, then most of that effort and time would be spent on perhaps diabetes, hypertension, you know, cholesterol and everything else that, you know, people really feel, uh, you know, sexy with, but not mental health. Uh, so it's really, you know, up to them to think about having their own division, their own mental health division, if what they identify mental health as being a one-third of the population problem. I think the other big issue is human resource. We only have 350 psychiatrists for a population of... 32 million, of course, psychologists are even less. I think there are only about 120 
clinical psychologist, if not mistaken. Uh, I'm not sure, Cheryl, is that increased a little bit around there, yeah. And only 14 in the Ministry of Health. Uh, and that's bizarre because apparently they have a cap on number of clinical psychologists that can be employed by the Ministry of Health and they equate them on the same par as counselors. Although clinical psychologists do masters and PhD and have more skills and you know, uh, can do assessments as well. So that uh, is, it's, it's a bit of a mess up and uh, it's really hard to understand that sort of process. Uh, but we also lack mental health workers and that's occupational therapists, social workers, mental health nurses. In fact, in Australia when I was working there, the backbone of mental health delivery was the mental health nurse. They were trained and dedicated people who were the front line. They would go out and see the patients and then come back and report during our morning meetings about the patient's condition. And they would do the first part of the clocking or the understanding of the patient's issues, build that relationship with the patient much better than the psychiatrist or psychologist could. You know, they have tea and maybe have a coffee with the patient and know their family and know everyone else around there and then report to the psychologist or psychiatrist. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's sad we don't have that, you know, big support network in terms of healthcare delivery. Uh, <clears throat> we also find that private healthcare is usually unaffordable to the majority of uh, Malaysians and that's largely because, as you heard, I think in Australia it's covered by Medicare or health insurance, but here it isn't. So there's no local health uh, insurance that covers mental health. I mean, there are some that are now starting to come in to cover. I think AIA is one, um, MSIG, I'm not too sure. That's the one that we have. But uh, yeah, they still have caps on who they cover and for how long. And even if they do cover, they may not cover uh, psychological therapies or treatments. So psychologists, you know, don't get paid from uh, insurance. Uh, if uh, that's required. Uh, there's also a lot of poor data that we have in Malaysia. We had the suicide registry that started in 2012, ran on for two years and just died, um, just committed suicide perhaps. But uh, essentially we don't have all this data and uh, whatever data we do have is perhaps not really you know, reliable as well. So we can't go back and fall back on understanding, you know, how many people have this problem, how many people have that, what services are available. So you can't collate all these things. And of course, there's a lack of research. So there's not enough research funding for things like this. I mean, I think if you put up a research proposal to find a cure for HIV, you'd get about two or five grants. But, uh, you know, to identify how to manage people with depression, you'd most probably be rejected in the first round. Uh, and then there's a separation of service, um, uh, you know, if you go to a general hospital, look for psychiatric services. They usually may be across the road in the old part of the hospital. One of those dilapidated buildings in Sramban. The psychiatric unit is in the, the first hospital, Sramban, from 1918. It was built in 1918 and it got discarded and they moved to the new spanky building with, you know, 500 beds. But they left psychiatry there. So psychiatry is in this old building and they hardly renovate. There have been plans to make a three or four story building. They can provide parking and you know, other services, but that was about five years ago. And there's still you know, no budget, no other things for it. People in cardiology get f funding much, much more than psychiatry does. The other big uh, difference in Australia and Malaysia is we still rely on institutional care. Hospital Bagia Olokinta has about 2,000 patients, half of which are never going to come out. They're there for the rest of their life. They have a cemetery there, they die and get buried there. Uh, Tampoi and, you know, uh, what do you call Sentosa in uh, KK and Aman in uh, Kuching, all house patients and some of them forever. Institutions have been done away with in developed countries. There is no need for them because most patients become reliant on the institution and they can't get out or their families just forget them and even pretend that they don't exist. So yeah, so that's another real sad part of it. And in fact, I think if we did away with institutions, we could spend that money on community care. So in Australia, there's a lot of community care before patients actually come to see the psychiatrist or the psychologist, they're already seen in the community by the mental health nurse or the social worker, they're already assessed and you know, a relationship and rapport is built. 
Um, and then case management, I think Peter had mentioned case management. Uh, we have identified patients with you know, unique and serious problems that could really benefit from case management where one person is in charge of his or, his or her overall care. There may be medical problems, there may be you know, mental health problems or drug or alcohol problems. And there's one person who can coordinate everything and, be, and you know, take that person through all the therapies and treatments that are required as well. I mean, a lot of our patients also don't have money, don't have you know, family support or don't have housing or don't have work. And all that needs to be catered to. So case management actually supports that. Uh, I think the other thing is GPs. In Malaysia, GPs do very little in terms of mental health. Uh, we are now starting to maybe see an increase. Uh, Peter and I were involved in training GPs this last Sunday, and uh, we had actually a, a big crowd, uh, quite a big crowd compared to before, and a lot of questions. So maybe that's changing, but also the medic medical curriculum needs to change. So people who are in healthcare professions need to maybe be aware what is mental health. What are psychiatric conditions? What are things that you can expect and see? Even nursing students and you know, occupational therapy students or medical students all need to know about mental health and be aware of this as well. Uh, I think the other thing that uh, also happens in Australia, which is sadly not as much in Malaysia, is the uh, NGOs and the consumer groups. Here in Malaysia, when you want to start a consumer group, the consumers often, oh, I don't want to let people know I have a mental illness. Or I don't want to, you know, the parents are saying, oh, this is fate, takdir, and we cannot, you know, you know question this. So we're not going to, you know, question governments why they're not paying enough or why they're not doing enough. We'll just let it be and carry on with the flow. So, yeah, so that uh, state of inertia is something that's sad. Uh, a lot of NGOs from other countries have come trying to set things up in Malaysia, and they've always hit a brick wall. But I think there's a movement now for change, and you know there are now newer NGOs like Relate and uh, the Malaysian Mental Health Association, and there's you know younger people taking a uh, role in trying to promote and understand and uh, educate people of mental health. Uh, we recently launched uh, something called the Panda Family, which we hope will bring to IMU Bukit Jalil soon. But essentially, it's collaborating with. Uh, Mind Matters Club in Sramban, which is you know one of those student uh, council groups uh, focusing on mental health. And the Panda family is a bot on the Facebook. Uh, so you can actually Google it and get it on maybe put it on your Facebook group. So it identifies people who may be talking about mental health problems and then takes them through AI certain questions and comments and provides them some resources to help them as well. Uh, because we have identified that young people, if they have mental health problems, will maybe rely more on internet rather than, you know, go and see a psychologist or psychiatrist or counselor. So instead of, you know, <coughs> trying to change them, it's better to be on their platform. I think finally, just to wind up, I think we have seen epidemiological changes in uh, in Malaysia <coughs> in terms of types of mental illness. I remember when I was working in Australia, the uh, people with, who were most challenging in admissions to the ward or even as outpatients were your borderline personality disorders. Uh, we're seeing an increase in that in Malaysia. We're seeing more of people with borderline personality, uh, those who have that you know, fear of abandonment and just you know, typically uh, unstable in their emotions and moods. Uh, and that can be quite challenging and if we don't focus on that and provide them the support that they need, it can really you know, be difficult for them as well to recover. So that's a bit that I wanted to share. Uh, now we'll open up for questions, if anybody has. Just want to, to add, you know, Philip's addressed some of the uh, concerns and challenges, I guess, within Malaysia. I just want to come back to something that actually I sincerely believe you do much better than we do in Australia. Uh, with the advent of the nuclear family, so just mum, dad and kids, we've actually often abdicated responsibility that the family has for looking after someone with a mental illness to the professionals. So, you know, uh, uh, 10 years ago I would have a family that would come in and say, you need to do something about my son or daughter. And the fact that, you know, it was the professional's job. Uh, we've also said to a lot of people with severe illness, you're too ill to work. 
you know, you, you, you're never going to get back to function and so, you know, give away your career. And the two things I see happening really well here is because the family does need the finances, you know, it's really important for the family member here to actually be back in the family and working and pu putting their contribution in, as, you know, as part of the family. And so, you know, there's an effort to actually rehabilitate people back into employment. And equally, there's that, I see largely the strong effort of the family, despite the fact that maybe initially the stigma may be greater, that when the family get on board for the individual, uh, I think they provide a much better level of family support. Now, now clearly that's not um, always the case. So, you know, I could demonstrate for you, you know, really involved families in Australia that actually do work with their loved one very much. But on the whole, I think the family involvement, the care involvement here is done a lot better. So, you know, whenever we compare and contrast, there are good things and, and not so good things that come across. So, sorry, with that, open to questions. Any questions? So for all treatment, not just acute. No. So, you know, for example, for me, I have a chronic skin condition which requires, um, you know, two prescriptions from time to time. Uh, my specialist writes those prescriptions out and I've been on them for five years or more. So, yeah, so $39.50 per script. So it doesn't matter how many drugs there are. No, it doesn't matter how many drugs. And in actual fact, um, if, you, if you land up spending, I think the ceiling now is somewhere between 1000 and 1500 Aussie dollars. Uh, if as, a, as an individual you spend that uh, amount of money with your prescriptions, you then go onto a free list. I guess for, for, as an example for treatment, what that means is, um, you know, we're able to use um, long-acting injectables for schizophrenia uh, at depots. Uh, so the new second generation ones uh, in our system are, are costing $300 plus per month. Now clearly if we were to pass that cost on to the patient, the patient m most of the time could not afford that. But they pay <coughs> either six dollars if they're a pensioner, or thirty-nine dollars fifty, and they get that regular injection every month. Any other questions? So I, I think I think with medications in Malaysia, they now don't give you more than a month supply, uh, and there may be good reasons for that because sometimes. You know, especially with benzodiazepines, patients collect and, you know, accumulate that. And uh, that can be quite dangerous, especially if they're suicidal. Uh, but also, because sometimes some medications are very expensive and they lose those medications and come back. And so, yeah, it's, there may need to be some rules and regulations about that. Any other questions? I think Cheryl will be able to answer that better than me. Uh, I'm not sure of how many institutions provide uh, three. Yeah, so I think there's UKM, HELP, and uh, CUCMS. Okay, yep. So, yeah, so that's, that's the question answered. But, uh, yeah, typically with uh, clinical psychology, you can look at, you know, employment with uh, hospitals. Uh, mostly government hospitals, private hospitals don't employ too many clinical psychologists. Uh, I've tried to get somebody in the hospital that I work in, Asunta. They are still a bit, you know, they're saying, well, maybe they'll charge too much. And <laughs> so it's a bit bizarre. Uh, but otherwise, in private uh, and private in group settings or, uh, or individually as well. So there are employment opportunities. I think most of it is locally in Klang Valley. 
because that's where your mental health awareness is highest. Uh, if you go out to EPO and you know, Sramban and all that, uh, you, if you have one clinical psychologist, then you'll be perceived as big competition if you open up your practice. Uh, but slowly that might change, uh, and hopefully every hospital sees the need for a clinical psychologist in their system. Um, so just for people to be aware, the question is in Australia, do psychiatrists provide um, levels of counselling or are they done by, by psychologists? Um, now the, the answer is both, to be fair. So uh, in some areas, because we have the privately, f the, the funded Medicare situation, someone can choose to go and see a private psychiatrist uh, for whatever condition. Providing, it, providing there is um, a uh, basically what they call an item number. So that's something that is actually billable for a service. And so if you have a diagnosis, you, you get that item, item number. Um, it varies. So for example, in South Australia, uh, there is a higher, um, higher number of private psychiatrists and they will often see people for regular counselling and therapy for a number of years. Uh, and there is actually a, a, an item number that allows that person maybe to see the psychiatrist up to twice a week. Um, now there's a lot of debate about whether that's useful use of a psychiatrist's time, when in other areas of the country we are struggling to get a psychiatrist to be able to do the first ass um, assessment for someone with depression. Uh, but, you know, as I say, you know, systems have good things and bad things about them. Um, most of the time, you know, good, you know, what I'd call the counselling that involves cognitive behavioural therapy and, and a whole lot of therapies around talking therapies and so forth are very well provided by psychologists on the whole. Yeah, so maybe in Malaysia, uh, most private psychiatrists would uh, do everything on their own, uh, the counselling and the medication and uh, but to be fair some of them are actually trained in psychotherapy so some do psychotherapy as a subspecialty I have a few who actually do psychotherapy and they spend one hour to one half hours with each patient uh, but uh, there are other centres like the mind faculty where I also work we have a policy that we always look at shared care so if somebody comes in, uh, they will maybe see the psychiatrist or the psychologist first, but then the patient is shared with the you know psychologist or psychiatrist as well, because the options need to be available for the patient. So, yeah, so it, it's better working together rather than you know in uh, solitary. Okay. Well, I, I think we're probably going to close. Um, so, look, I can never res resist actually doing a positive advertisement for mental health. I can, um, and so two things. Firstly, acknowledge that patients with mental health most of the time now can actually have a level of recovery. We used to look much more at an illness model, uh, but people recover. And even if it's actually lifting from 20% of function as a person with schizophrenia to 30%, that 10% recovery for them is really meaningful. So, you know, re remember the positive message of hope that we can work with patients. The other thing is going back to that um, youth mental health uh, day, you know, it calls upon all of us at whatever levels of our career, uh, wherever we are in the community to do our best to promote good mental health care and particularly this year to be supporters for uh, youth mental health. Uh, and increase services and so you know if it's appropriate through Philip backwards and forwards if you want to see uh, have a copy of those PowerPoint slides uh, from yesterday uh, there's nothing in those slides that isn't sort of public knowledge to share with you I'm very happy for those slides to be distributed amongst the group of you now sorry you had another question <laughs>